Weird Table Goth. Today we're going to talk about the basics of combat in Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. Combat is pretty simple in this game. That's intentional. It's not a combat simulator in this game. Your names. Oh, God. <laughs> Welcome. We are Table Goth. I am Bully. And I'm Mandy. And today we're going to talk to you about combat in Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. Vampire is not a combat simulator, so the combat system is uh, more narrative and really simple. You pretty much, you take your fight dice, you roll against whoever you're fighting, and whoever has more successes wins. That's pretty much the video. Uh, and if you want to use really cool dice for this, like metal dice that are specific for vampire, and you can get like specifically for your clan, and have like a sweet blood splatter for dramatic flair in your combat, you should use our link below to get some level up dice that has just what I described. So do that. So the system follows basic narrative uh, conflict. Um, so you don't have to worry about like movement speed, uh, you know, that you do in other uh, type of tabletop RPGs. Um, you kind of just decide what you want to do and then uh, your storyteller gives you the dice that you would use. So what you want to do determines what you're going to roll, and the storyteller will let you know. Sometimes this is going to be you rolling your dice pool against an NPC's dice pool. Sometimes the storyteller is just going to set a static difficulty for your opponent, and you got to roll against that. And pretty much all you're trying to do is get more successes than the person you're fighting. And how much you win by determines how much damage you do. So if you're punching someone in the face. Mm -hmm. Uh, you would use Strength and Brawl. Uh, compose your firearms if you're trying to shoot them. Uh, perhaps in the face. Uh, or maybe Dex Melee if you're uh, using a knife, trying to cut someone up. In these combat rolls, dice can be added or subtracted depending on the situation. Um, weapons add damage to the total if you happen to win your conflict roll. And initiative doesn't really matter. Conflict rolls are all sort of happening at the same time. Um, you're not really rolling like, okay, I rolled to punch you and you rolled to punch me. You just roll like, okay, me and you are punching each other. If that's what we're both doing, we're both rolling strength brawl. Whoever has more successfully punched the other one more. And if I rolled five successes to punch Mandy in the face, Mandy only rolled three, that means I get to do two damage to her. It's as simple as that. I don't know if I talk about punching a woman in the face. <laughs> So under this turn order doesn't happen a whole lot because unless there's multiple fights happening, if there's two characters in close quarters fights, um, and there's two people in a range fight, the general rules go like a, a fight that's already happening that resolves first, then a ranged fight, and then anything new, any new fights happening, and then sort of anything else. A lot of things can be happening in a conflict round that isn't necessarily just two people attacking each other. And the storyteller pretty much determines the order of these things happen. All the players say, I, I'm trying to do this. Mm -hmm. Storyteller decides what the non-player characters are doing, and then you just figure out the order and roll it out. So conflict doesn't just have to involve you fighting back. Maybe you didn't make a bruiser character and your whole plan to stay alive in this encounter is just avoid getting hit. Uh, so you could roll dex athletics to dodge a fist or a car or, you know, those kinds of things. Dodging gunfire is obviously a little more difficult, so there would be a negative dice penalty uh, unless cover was engaged, cover was used. <sighs> Cover was engaged. <laughs> it literally... Do I have that written I, or are you no, saying this? I'm just making stuff up. Okay. <laughs> so obviously dodging gunfire is pretty difficult. So in those kinds of cases, you would take a negative two dice penalty unless cover was... <laughs> now, <laughs> now I'm thinking of engaged. <laughs> I know. Dodging gunfire is obviously pretty difficult. So if you were to try to do that, there would be a negative two dice penalty unless cover was in use. So yeah, this is an example of different situations needing different dice. Um, obviously, not everything is just you trying to hurt each other and getting the damage. There's dodging. There's just messing with the situation. You, there's People could be trying to talk to someone or could intimidate someone while other people are duking it out. There's a lot of different roles that can happen once like you're in conflict and you start doing turns. And like I said, things like dodging gunfire, stuff like that. There's the dice penalties can be had for certain things, uh, or maybe you get dice bonuses for certain things, just like any other roll. 
Um, when fighting multiple enemies, since it gets since everything's not really a one-on-one -on -one attack, you split your dice pool essentially. So you decide like, okay, I, I'm using I'm using a knife. I'm using Dex melee. That's your pool, and you decide how you want to split that dice against however many attackers. If you're fighting two people, you could just split it evenly, or you could be like, I really want to stab this person, so I'm going to use most of the dice for that, and I'm going to use save a couple dice, and so maybe I could get a quick stab on them. Mm -hmm. So they'll both roll with their full dice against you, and you'll have to split it accordingly. Um, if you're dodging a bunch of stuff, you essentially are going to lose a dice for, for your dodge pool for every successive attack you're dodging. So with taking damage as a kindred... Um you have superficial and aggravated. Superficial is the less worrisome stuff. Um, superficial is halved when you uh, take damage. Um, so instead of taking basic math, eight damage, uh, you take four because you're kindred. Perfect. So you're superpowers. That's <laughs> all the math. math I got for us today. And you, uh, <laughs> you round up otherwise okay. if it isn't a nice even math mm -hmm. like that example. I only use even math. <laughs> Um, aggravated, on the other hand, is a little more aggravating. Uh, <laughs> I had to um, fire sunlight. Um, some really powerful disciplines or supernatural creatures um, can cause that. Uh, and weapons, um, they add to the damage, not your dice pool. So if you have a plus two to like a really cool samurai sword or something, then uh, you don't add plus two when you're rolling. Um, it just adds on to the damage. In the book, the damage ratings, uh, the range they have is either plus one, example, if it's like brass knuckles, up to a plus four, which is like taking a shotgun close range. So you'll do your normal pulls, like you said, and then if you beat someone by one, you do one damage to them and then add whatever your weapon damage is. Disciplines get to add things. There's other things that will add this bonus damage at the end. The system has a unique way of tracking damage. You don't have hit points or anything like that. You have a health pool, which are just blank dots. Every superficial damage you take, which as a kindred is pretty much everything except the few things that are aggravated, uh, you do a little slash. And as you take those slashes, again, you have it, and then you take what's left. Uh, and that fills up your health tracker. Once your health tracker is completely full, you're not dead, you're impaired, which means all of your physical rolls are going to be at negative two dice. And then once your health tracker is full, any more damage you take, you start taking those little slashes and you make them X's, representing aggravated damage. Once your health tracker is full of aggravated damage or X's, that's when you are knocked out, you're in a torpor, you're in this comatose state. Um, the only way to get final death is if once you're comatose, once you're in torpor, someone burns you, leaves you in the sun, decapitates you, or does something to just completely obliterate your body. Aggravated damage, when you take it, is just immediately marked as an X. Um, you can have a mixture of both. You can have a few marked as superficial damage, a few marked as aggravated. Um, again, it doesn't matter, but once that pool is, once your health tracker is full up, everything just starts going to aggravated no matter what. But you can take aggravated right off the bat. Stakes are sort of a weird exception to this, where if you get staked in the heart, the classic vampire thing, um, you are automatically put in torpor. So even if your health isn't all the way filled up if someone gets it's a very difficult role that you need a lot of successes to do but some man's to just stake you without putting you in a torpor first that automatically knocks you in a torpor once that stakes pull out of the heart your vampire's fine again well they're not in torpor anymore <laughs> uh typically how staking works is you have to knock someone down to aggro to torpor first and then once they're staked they never come out of torpor unless the stake is removed kindred can heal superficial damage um do you want to mention that we fuck this up sometimes no. So Kindred can mend superficial damage um, by arousing blood and potentially getting hungrier. Uh, you can heal the number of superficial damage based on your blood potency. Um, you can do this once a turn. Aggravated damage is more difficult to heal. So you can mend one level of aggravated damage after uh, resting. So you have to wait sort of the next night. If you take ag aggravated damage, you have to go to your day sleep. And then when you awaken, you can rouse the blood to mend one aggravated damage per night. It takes three rouse checks to heal one aggravated. And that's in addition to the rouse check you're making for waking up. So if you're going to wake up and heal an aggravated wound, you're going to be making four rouse checks, which can make you super hungry. Mm -hmm. And per the normal hunger rules, if you 
go over 5 hunger just trying to wake up, you go into torpor for the night. So it's sort of a risk of that, and that's why sometimes aggravated wounds could stick around for a while until you can feed and make it safe to heal those. And no matter how high your blood potency is or any of that, you can still only heal one aggravated wound a night, and only when you're waking up for the night. If you are staked or hurt into torpor or whatever, or going to hunger torpor, you stay in torpor for as long as your, your humanity determines how long. A vampire with a high humanity isn't going to be in torpor, stuck in this, which is like this comatose state. Uh, they'll, during that first short amount of time, an old vampire with, or vampire with really low humanity, if they get knocked into torpor, they're stuck in torpor for months to years to decades even. Um, the only way to get out of torpor is either to wait that out, or you could be fed blood of a higher blood potency than you have, and that can get you out of it early when you wake up. There is a much more advanced combat system in the book that's optional, and it gives you a lot more detailed rules on like initiative uh, modifiers for trying to certain things like biting someone or dodging or doing an all-out attack or all-out defense. So if you sort of want the gritty detailed combat, uh, it is in there, and we sort of pick and choose ones to use in our game. Uh, the one the book suggests, they also have a, it's called Three Turns and Out where essentially if a conflict doesn't resolve in three turns, the storyteller should sort of, depending on how things are going, whichever side seems to be winning, they just sort of you find a way to resolve that conflict after that and move on. Because again, this isn't a combat simulator. You're not here mm -hmm. to like knock down hit points and do all that stuff. It's And it's supposed to be very narrative. So it's not like I attack, you say like, okay, I want to do this. Storyteller tells you how that happens. So it's harder to keep combat interesting narratively if it's super long. Yeah, so I think that covers the basics for mm -hmm. if you're wondering what combat's like in this game, it's a very, I like the system. Mm -hmm. I like rolling against something rather than rolling against just a number all the time, like mm -hmm. armor class or whatever. It's, it's fun them rolling back and forth with you, but it also is nice having the option to speed things up. Yeah. Um, and like, I, like, like you said, you don't always, it's nice to know what you can do, mm -hmm. um, but it's also nice knowing you can do anything, which can be overwhelming for some new players, knowing like, I don't have a list of moves I can do. I don't have a list of yeah. attacks that do this that, yeah. stuff. I, I like structure, so I know mm -hmm. how to do something. And so I think that was something I struggled with for a little while. And then I just like watched a lot of action movies and gave me a lot of ideas. <laughs> that explains a lot about <laughs> the stuff you tried. No, I watched, I watched mm -hmm. a, a specific movie. It was so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Helps so, me a lot. So yeah, that, that's essentially, you as a player, don't expect to sit down with your mm -hmm. sheet and being like, okay, my character could do this attack or they could do this thing. It's more of you tell you tell the storyteller, like, yeah, I'm going to take this tire and hit him or yep. I'm going to use my protean to pop claws and do whatever. I'm going to try to shoot this or hide. This, when conflict happens, there's so many things mm -hmm. you can do. So you have a lot of creative freedom. It can also be a little overwhelming. Um so just sort of trust your gut, and then mm -hmm. if you want to try something crazy, yeah. do something crazy. A lot of characters also just might not be built for combat at yeah. all. So, no, I mean, this is a game where you can have many sessions mm -hmm. where no one throws a punch, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's not a boring game, necessarily. It's still building things up for mm -hmm. the eventual conflict. Like, there's going to be one eventually. It might yeah. not happen uh, for uh, a other, while. other games are built to where every class or whatever mm -hmm. you're playing has some sort of combat utility, some mm -hmm. sort of role they play in a fight. This game does not have that. So you could build a character that has no role in the fight, mm -hmm. but they're great at everything else. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind. But yeah, that's our gist of uh, fighting things in Vampire. Is there any other advice, wisdom you have about fighting people? Creativity is your greatest weapon. Creativity <laughs> is your greatest weapon. The number one rule for Vampire <laughs> Masquerade fighting. Um, if you want other more concrete rules, we'll be doing a video on that later with the advanced combat system and getting into social combat. Otherwise, I think that's it for our basic overview of combat in the game. Yeah? Yep. All right. Bye. If you want to level up your dice. God damn, stop talking. <laughs> this is why you're not doing that. <laughs> oh, sorry. I got a really bad itch. Okay, I'll start over. <laughs> it's because I learned all my, like, social interactions from books. Uh, <laughs> it's not a joke. Uh... <sighs>